Coming up on DTNS, just how big is the PlayStation 5? Drones monitor your social distancing and how to podcast for hours when your power and even your internet is out. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 12th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing from the top Columbus, tech Ohio. from Cleveland. <laughs> Drawing the top tech from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I am Rob Dunwood from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking a lot about Jerry Springer uh, for some reason. A lot of Ohio celebrities were part of Good Day Internet's discussion today. If you want to get that wider conversation, become a member of patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Bloomberg reports that Google has countersued Sonos, claiming that the smart speaker company infringed on its patents. Sonos originally sued Google back in January for alleged patent infringement, claiming that Google used information about its technology while the two companies were collaborating to develop its own smart speaker line, saying Google basically told, took our stuff and, and ran with it. Google now says Sonos made false claims about the shared work and allege that Sonos is using Google search, software networking, audio processing, and other technology without paying a license fee. Zoom says it suspended meetings and Zoom accounts of three users because it did not have the ability to block participants in meetings based on country. Zoom had suspended the accounts of two U.S. users and one in Hong Kong after China complained its citizens were participating in illegal meetings. Zoom says it will develop the ability to block participants by country and will not let Chinese requests affect non-Chinese users in the future. A Reddit user posted that YouTube videos can be watched in a web browser without ads if you add a period after the dot com in the YouTube link. That will remove pre-roll and mid-roll ads, apparently. The Verge notes that by the time you've copied, pasted, and altered the video URL, it might not be the world's biggest time saver, but you won't see the ad. Man, I wish I had that yesterday, because it will be patched soon. Back in March, Computex pushed its annual Taiwan trade show back from June to late September due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That rescheduled show is now rescheduled again for June 1st through 5th of 2021. Twitter says it removed 32,242 accounts tied to the governments of China, Russia, and Turkey for violating its policy on information manipulation. 23,750 Chinese accounts were spreading misinformation about Hong Kong, Taiwan, COVID-19, and an exiled Chinese billionaire. 7,340 accounts were attempting to support a political party of the president, and 1,152 Russian accounts were promoting its president's party and attacking dissidents. Twitch will start automatically scanning clips of live streams for copyrighted music. This follows that recent wave of DMCA takedown requests against clips. Twitch says that clips will be automatically deleted and won't result in strikes or penalties for creators. So they'll be safe from that. But there's also no opportunity to appeal a takedown. Twitch will also add an option to just delete all your clips from a channel at once to help those dealing with the backlog. According to The Intercept sources, at an internal meeting on what, Wednesday at Facebook, the company showed off a new content moderation feature for Workplace that lets admins remove and block certain trending topics among employees. Facebook used the word unionize as an example in the slide deck. Facebook told the Next Web the example was poorly chosen and has pulled any plans to roll out the moderation feature. Warner Media is simplifying HBO branding. It will get rid of HBO Go, since most customers who use it can use the new HBO Max instead. Um, the HBO Now app will remain available, but will be renamed HBO. And HBO Max will become the main app, though it is not available on Roku, Fire TV um, at this time. Those users can only use the HBO app. I guess that's technically simpler. <laughs> technically. I guess, I mean, that's how complicated it was to begin with. Uh, finally, OpenAI launched its API in beta, its first commercial offering. It can do things like translate between languages, write news stories, poems, answer everyday questions. OpenAI expects it to be used for things like customer service chat, educational products, maybe some games. The API is available only to qualified customers, and even those qualified customers could have their access cut off if OpenAI determines it's being used for harm. All right. 
just after the show yesterday, Sony uh, unveiled the hardware, not just games, but the hardware, uh, at least what it looks like for the PlayStation 5. What, what do we got, Rob? So Sony revealed the design of the black and white PlayStation 5, which will come in two versions, one with a 4K Blu-ray drive and a pure digital edition. The console will sit vertically on its side, includes USB-A and C ports on the front with a heat vent at the top of the vertical position. Sony also revealed that excuse me, Sony also revealed accessories for the PS5, including a dual sense charging station for two controllers, a new HD camera with dual 1080p lenses, a pulse 3D wireless headset with 3D audio, and a media remote with a microphone. Pricing and release dates of the console and accessories were not announced. Yeah, and we'd we'd had most of the specs about this. We've talked about that before on the show. So this really was just a reveal of the look. And, uh, oh, boy, did the Internet have fun with oh, what this a, thing looks like. A polarizing look. I mean, I don't I don't know how the rest of you feel. It seems to me, and I, I don't know, when I first saw it, I was like, ooh, I don't know about that. Like, okay, you can go horizontal or vertical, but, like, I'm like, in this day and age, don't we just want to hide all this stuff? Like, I don't want to see this. It does look like a cross between an envelope and a giant um, cable modem that you would get from your cable company. <laughs> but it, it looks like that for the time that you're putting it under something where it's not going to be seen by anyone. So I really think that uh, although the Internet is uh, enraged over the design of this, no one's going to really care once they actually get these things, plug them in and start playing the games. Man, well, I really was going to pick up my cable modem and put two white envelopes on each side because uh, it really does look like that, but my my cord won't reach. I would take myself off the internet if I tried. Uh, the thing is, like, it does look a little weird. Uh, people are going to get used to it, and no one's going to be worried about it uh, in the future. It might be a little awkward to put in an entertainment center, right? Because it's got the the weird curve to it, but I'm sure you can set it on its side if you have to, and it'll work just fine. Um, I don't know. I, I I think it's 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 fun to talk about how how odd this is, but in the in the end, I don't think that's really going to affect anybody's purchase decisions. I don't know, do you? man. I I I I just feel like we're getting to the point where it's like AK capable. Very cool. Do I want to see it? Nope, I don't. Like. Why do you have to yeah. see the thing that's offering you all this great, you know, this this content? I, I, and I might be wrong, but I, I feel like less is more. And this is big. This thing is huge. Yeah, it is. If you if you scale device. it based on the USB ports, right? And people are doing all kinds of mockups on the internet of of how it sits. It's the biggest console in memory. <laughs> yeah, I just want it to be quiet mm -hmm. uh, and not overheat if I forget to open a glass up on the entertainment system, that's all yep. I'm looking for. Just be quiet and don't overheat easily. Well, and it, uh, the way it looks like uh, it, the, the vents, uh, it could be louder. They might not be though. We don't know. We don't know the price. There's so much more to know. Uh, we really just got to look at it and the accessories look fine. The UK Competition and Markets Authority began an investigation into Facebook's acquisition of Giphy and will accept comments on the case from third parties until July 3rd. The investigation will specifically look at how and if the deal will lessen competition in the two companies' respective markets. During the investigation, Facebook can't continue with any actions related to the acquisition without written consent from the CMA, and Facebook also announced in May that it planned to buy Giphy and integrate it into the Instagram team. So this has been a bit of a long time coming, but yet... When it comes to a very popular GIF app, it might be antitrust. It was exactly a month ago when I was last on the show when we first heard that this was going to happen. And a month later, it's about the time of when the UK is going to sue the, <laughs> sue the organization is doing something this big. It's, you know, th these companies can't make moves without getting sued by the UK seemingly. And, you know, for good reason. It's not like they're just innocent bystanders and stuff that they do. But uh, this one, you know, um, you know, competition amongst Giphy type <laughs> companies. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's, I don't know that that's a real problem, but, uh, you know, m maybe it is. Maybe they should really look into it. <laughs> The the UK, unlike the EU, has actually looked into a lot of these kinds of acquisitions, like WhatsApp, when Facebook looked at WhatsApp, and, and let them go. They've been pretty soft on it. So they may be trying to toughen up by even looking at things like Giphy, but I can't imagine they'll, they'll not allow this. I mean, Giphy makes no money yet. Uh, it's not 
probably going to make money. I don't know that you can demonstrate that this will undermine our ability to find alternate sources for animated GIFs on the internet, as popular as Giphy is. Um, not sure this one's going to count as antitrust. I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, here's something else that Facebook is up to. Uh, Facebook announced the results of its deep fake detection challenge, an effort to find algorithms that can detect when videos have been manipulated by artificial intelligence. There were 2,114 participants. Uh, together, they submitted around 25,000 algorithms and were trained on clips created by Facebook that some had been manipulated and some weren't. They gave participants that data set to train. On the test set, accuracy rates reached as high as 82.56%. However, for the challenge, the algorithms had to detect deep fakes in never before seen footage. Uh, so they got to train on this data set, but then they gave them a black box and like, okay, you, this, we'll see how well your algorithm works with stuff it couldn't have seen before, stuff outside of the data set. The winning algorithm had an accuracy of 65.18%. Uh, those winning algorithms, including that one, will be released as open source so that other companies can use them. And Facebook CTO Mike Schrepfer said that these results set a benchmark to guide future work. Yeah, I mean, that isn't a great percentage. Um, however, <laughs> you know, if there are going to be yet more deep fakes all the time and there has to be AI to determine what might be a deep fake, we're getting there. Uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, I'm just glad that they are doing this. I mean, it's, I think it was last summer, the end of last summer, when they actually kicked this uh, campaign off. And the fact that they actually are trying to go out and find this stuff is 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 a good thing because it's not like the people who are making deep fakes are going to get less sophisticated as time goes by. So the fact that they're trying to counteract that to me is is a good thing, even if it's only sixty five percent accurate on stuff that they don't know potentially could be a deep fake. Um, I think it's a good start. Yeah, because right now, uh, despite all of the worry when deep fakes sort of first appeared on the scene, they're generally used for adult videos. Uh, they're, they're not being used to fool people yet. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't be at some point, that we won't have a deep fake that people won't be able to identify uh, that, that causes trouble. And so you want people working on how to identify them now before they become a problem. This is this is an example of, of, of the technology industry getting ahead of a problem for once rather than waiting for it to become a big problem. So, so that's good. I'd, I'd like to see more of these kinds of programs uh, beyond just this one from Facebook. This is a good start, though. Yeah, really. and, and it's a great example of like, okay, well, you can't just like let the humans go away and go to lunch and let the AI do everything because it's not there yet. Humans and 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 learning in conjunction together will get that percentage up a lot better in the future based on, you know, what is being flagged and what is, you know, is is maybe confusing the robot. Yeah, that's a really good point because even at 65%, you still have us looking at things and going, well, wait a minute, that may look real, but I know it can't be because of this fact that I know. So if you're cutting down the number of those that you have to deal with, that that's a good start. And it hopefully will only get better. Yeah, like I said, I think it's, you know, this is definitely a good start. It's only going to get better as deep fakes also get better. Yeah. And I'm just glad that they're going in this direction because I can just imagine a time, we're not far from it, you know, three, four years from now, you're going to be able to make a deep fake on your phone that you simply, unless you just know that the person that is in the video was sitting right next to you while the video was being made, uh, you, you know, you're not going to be able to tell. So I'm glad that they are working on this. Yeah, you're right. It's going to be an arms race. The U.S. National Science Foundation announced the security and privacy in the life cycle of Internet of Things of Consumer Environments, or SPLICE. That is a mouthful right there, so we're going to refer to this as SPLICE forevermore. <laughs> uh, SPLICE project led by Dartmouth University to increase IoT security. SPLICE will start with research into fields like privacy, interface design, mobile computing, embedded systems, wireless networks, and more. Splice wants to create a toolkit which understands how their smart devices work. It wants to encourage a privacy model that doesn't require a sophisticated user to figure out. Um, Splice will develop a prototype of products um, and will create an advisory council to recommend best practices. Splice is scheduled to launch on October 1st. 
Oh man, this is this is definitely necessary because uh, just on the on the the question of privacy, and I know Splice is going to be dealing with more than just that, but just on the question of privacy, uh, having some technical sophistication myself, I would like to think uh, sometimes it's a hunt to figure out what your options are and how to, how to lock them down. And that's not the way it should be. Uh, if for if people are going to generally be using them in their life. A lot of people are not going to want to do that. Even if they could, they're not going to want to do it. And a lot of people just will be like, I can't figure this out. So having a system that you, if you can get the IoT industry on board to say, protect privacy out of the box, make it easy. I think that's really important. I know. When I get that blender that somehow has internet connectivity on it, I'm not <laughs> configuring it. I'm going to plug it in and hit a button, and then the button's going to turn blue, and then it's working. That That's generally all that I'm willing to do. And I'm a technology-type person. So I can just see, and, you know, I always refer, you know, back to my mother-in-law, my mother. They're not going to, you know, even if they know to look for settings and make this thing more secure, that's just not what they're going to do. Whatever comes out of the box is how they're going to use the device. So the fact that they're trying to make this easier for people like that, I applaud this effort. I don't like the name. It's way too long, though. <laughs> yeah. Spice, you know, that rolls off well, the tongue spice, nicely. The, the acronym is fine, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure what splicing has to do with protecting my privacy and security, but I'm not going to question that too too much. Uh, the, the, the other aspect of this beyond the privacy is the security. You may need to make that default easy too. That I think that's an easier one to fix, which is like complex passwords, not simple passwords, passwords at all uh, that, that are set uh, by default. Uh, making it, you know, easy to manage things. Uh, that that's that's part of this. So there is a lot of work for this uh, foundation uh, to do, and uh, and I'm glad that that it's created. We'll, we'll keep an eye on what comes out of it, of course. But it, it's it's a good effort uh, or good intentions, I should say. Well, let's talk about drones, shall okay. we? Airspace systems known as making unmanned aerial vehicles that can capture other unmanned aerial vehicles said Thursday it announced that it had made software to monitor social distancing and ma face mask wearing from the air. You can see what you're doing from up here. The software can analyze video from the air or surface cameras to detect whether face masks are being worn or not and how often people stand too close together. Doesn't use any kind of facial recognition, doesn't store images of people, but it does generate tables of data with percentages of compliance to mask wearing and social distancing and can be used to generate alerts. Airspace intends to sell its software to cities and police. Lisa starts. Yeah, uh, this this is a story that's that's rife with uh, potential for misunderstanding uh, and, and requires you to, to trust airspace systems and the entities that use the software uh, a little bit too. But I do want to emphasize that they don't record any video. You know, obviously we need to audit this and make sure they're doing what they say. But if we take them at their word, they're not using facial recognition. They're not even storing video. They're creating a table. Uh, they're monitoring a live stream of video and saying, okay, we think 20% of this audience was, uh, this group was not wearing masks. And I think the idea, if I have it right, is that you could deploy this when there's a music festival going on or or at a yeah. mall and yeah. send alerts to people in the area that says, hey, don't forget to wear your mask if it detects a threshold of people above a certain amount that aren't wearing them or not social distancing or whatever. Yeah, it's it's funny. There's <laughs> I have a couple <laughs> instances of sort of drone weirdness around where I live. The other day I was running my dog around. It was just me and my dog. There was no one else around that I knew of, but there was a drone flying overhead. And eventually a guy kind of like pulls up in a truck and was like, is that your drone? And I'm like, not my drone. I don't know whose drone that is. He goes, okay, well, that's, it's flying over my mother's house. That's not cool. And I was like, I agree. It's not my drone. I mean, you can look in my trunk if you want, you know, kind of thing. It was like, People get very weirded out about this stuff, especially when they don't understand why it's going on and, 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 and you know, for what reason. Um, that was kind of a one-off. I also went to a restaurant yesterday. I met a friend. Uh, the restaurant is, is officially open as long as you sit outside, which we did. All of the, you know, the, the, um, the tables were, were pretty far away from each other, although the place was pretty packed, but, you know, it felt safe. But I thought to myself the entire time, 
if there was a drone over us, how much would people lose their minds? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's like, there's just a lot of uncertainty about like, what is right? Are we doing the right thing? Are we being cool? Are we, you know, are we following protocol? Are we endangering our, 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 our peers? And, you know, so, so something like this is, it's a very delicate time to introduce this technology. Yeah, I was uh, thinking the same thing. I don't like drones flying above me, not taking <laughs> pictures. So uh, clearly, this, they're, they're not recording this video. They're just, you know, using this for the software to, you know, to, to determine how many people has mask on as compared to how many don't. But it's just going to make me uncomfortable to see those drones flying above me, especially when you hear things about, you know, that the, you know, the data is going to be turned over to potentially like the police. It's like, you know, well, how, how, what is the stretch that maybe they can tell who was there based on it? You know, I, you know, there, can that software look at my eyes and tell if it's me or tell if it's the guy next to me? You know, can it can it do those kind of things? This software doesn't do that. But those questions are going to kind of come up and it's going to give general people just an uncomfortability with being monitored. And I'm doing the air quotes right now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's it's uh, it, it's it's cool software. I just don't think people are going to like it. It's a yeah, that's why I mentioned the auditing. Like you got to you got to make sure that this thing is doing what they're saying it's going to do. I, I'm Thrumwald in our, our Twitch chat was like, so you can't use it for enforcement. I'm like, no, it's not meant for enforcement. He's like, but I thought they were selling it to law enforcement. I'm like, yeah, they are. He's like really confused. He's like, actually, sometimes the police are just doing crowd control. And what they want is the ability to tell, you know, maybe even just over a loudspeaker, like, hey, everybody maintain social distancing. And this would let them know, like, hey, you've got a problem. You need to you need to remind people more to do this to, to kind of get compliance, but not to actually go after individuals. Whether you think that's useful or not, that's a whole different conversation. But I think that's kind of the intention. Mm -hmm. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget you can subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. I was listening to the SMR podcast uh, this week, Rob, and uh, enjoying it as always until you uh, and, and then, then you made the magic reveal towards the end that you had been recording and you guys record live. You stream live the entire show uh, without power or Internet. Now, you obviously had internet somehow because you were, you were able to stream. So let us know what happened and how you were able to pull off this magical feat. So, yeah, so living here in the in the Midwest, we get these ridiculous thunderstorm, thunderstorms. Um, and uh, my power went out on Wednesday. It went out probably an hour before we record the show. So I'm like, oh, how am I going to do the show? Are we going to have to cancel it, move it to another night, which is not a thing for us. We, we move the show around all the time to accommodate schedules. But I'm like, wait a minute, I got a lot of batteries in the house. Maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can figure something out. So normally I do the show. I've got a little, uh, you know, just a little all in one PC that I, you know, only use for podcasting. So, well, that's not going to work because I don't have any power for that. So, uh, fortunately I had Skype installed on a laptop. So I said, okay, well, we've got Skype installed. Um, and um, I hope that battery on that laptop is charged up because I don't just think, let me make sure that my, you know, batteries on my laptop are charged up all the time. So I said, well, if the battery in the laptop is not going to get me through the entire show, I've got to have a backup. So I have got, uh, you know, just a plethora of these little anchor power cores. Um, I've got an anchor core power or what is it? Anchor power core 5,000. Um, you know, each one of my daughters and my wife has one. I've got an anchor core, um, you know, two, um, which is 20,000 uh, milliamps. And I've actually got the uh, um, core 26,800 as well. So I so said, I've got ample power as long as I can just find the devices that will accept it and, and charge up. So fortunately, my laptop had probably 65 percent, 70 percent, you know, charge on it. So that's going to get me at least an hour. Um, you know, um, it's an older laptop, so that battery doesn't last very long. And if I need to, I can switch over to using one of my tablets or using my phone or something like that. So, you know, and just testing this out, I only had about an hour. I was like, okay, wait a minute. What about my mic? Um, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to power that? You know, fortunately I did have a, uh, in, you know, an older USB mic that I was able to use. So I didn't have to worry about trying to power a mixer and all this kind of stuff that mm -hmm. I normally do. So I was able to use a USB mic, um, a various assortment of 
batteries to power my cell phone, which is what I use to get internet access. So I just use my cell phone as a hotspot, gave you know internet access to my laptop, which had about an hour of battery life on it. And then also my tablet uh, was charged off of the third uh, power cord that I had in my assortment of uh, batteries. And we were able to get through pretty much the entire show. And at the you know time when you found out that I actually did it, it was at the end when they said, oh, turn the camera on and, and let's see. And we didn't want to turn the camera on. You, all, all you saw were teeth and eyes because <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's pretty dark. I mean, I do the show down in my basement and there was literally zero light down there. So I had like just a light off of my off of my devices and a little flashlight. So I, so I didn't have enough light to actually do the video. So I didn't throw video for most of the show. But everything else worked pretty flawlessly, and uh, I was actually even able to switch from my laptop because my battery did go dead. Rod caught it, so he just started talking and waited until I connected back in. And I don't think that the audience actually noticed, but I did switch mid, uh, you know, mid broadcast from a laptop um, to my tablet. And what was cool was that, you know, my tablet has a USB-C connector. It's, you know, I use an Android tablet. I was actually able to plug one of those little, uh, you know, little adapters that you get in your phone oh. when you buy a phone mm -hmm. um, to, you know, take data off of one phone and put it on the other. I was able to use that adapter to plug my USB mic into my tablet to still get the same audio, uh, you know, from the mic. So I think it, you know, got a little bit crispier because I do use a couple things on the computer to clean my audio up, but that was literally like the last four or five minutes in the show. And I don't think anybody noticed. No, until, until you said something, I had not noticed uh, as a listener that you had switched over because your audio was was as good, almost as good. Like you say, once you said it, I was like, oh, maybe there is a little bit of crunch here and there. But but for the most part, like that, that's elegant to be able to just like even keep the mic, uh, switch it over. So, uh, I mean, granted, uh, anybody could look at this and go, well, if you had a, a UPS or, or, you know, there's all kinds of things you could do if, if you want to plan for this. But what I admired was the, in the moment, like, what do I have? <laughs> what, do, what do I have around that, that I could use to make that happen? That was pretty good. Yeah, and these, these um, you know, uh, I'll do a plug for Anchor. The, these power cords are awesome because I know I have not used um, the big ones, the 26800 uh, or the two or the 20,000. I have not used them this year. So I'm going on charges for those things that are from last year, the last time I probably used them when wow. I was out and about and doing stuff. So, um, you know, they both had at least 80% charge on them, and uh, they, they definitely got me through the day. Great. No, that's cool. Yeah, we'll have uh, links to all the uh, power cores from Anchor that he was talking about uh, in the show notes as well. So uh, uh, cool. Uh, and, and well done. Again, good stuff. Yeah, you know, we got to make sure the show goes on for America. That's they, right. They like <laughs> and the world. And the world. That is true. Uh, if you have other ideas, or maybe you 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 know agree with what Rob put together, join in our conversation at our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com/dtns. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Uh, this one came in from Dustin, who says the other day, you mentioned that open source and portable clouds are the future. I'm a Google Cloud engineer, and I'm happy to tell you that this is part of Google Cloud's approach. We have a number of open source products that if our customers are unhappy with the quality of our service, they can easily move their workloads to another cloud or even their own data centers. Rob? <laughs> uh, that's really, really cool tech for people who are really, really into tech. I, I just don't know that that's going to be a thing any time in the foreseeable future. Foreseeable future meaning like the next mm. year to 18 months. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in years from now, but I don't see clouds just springing up and you just moving from data center to data center all willy-nilly. I just, I just don't see that. Not yet. Yeah, it does seem, it seems like if that wasn't messy, that'd be great, but is it really not messy at this point? I don't know, Tom, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm with you on this. Like, it, it's a cool thing to have. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how many people will take advantage of it. Certainly on the enterprise level, right? That, that's a whole different thing. Might make, make it easier there. Uh, I'd like to see more companies doing it and more offerings out there. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Andrew Radley, Paulo Jacob, and Scott Hepburn. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing uh, a lot of our tech thoughts uh, during the show. Yeah. What, what have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, I, I drew a piece which I like to call Engineered to Enrage. 
Um, you know, and by the way, before I start getting notes about this, I I, I sort of uh, uh, took some liberties with the shape of the PS5 here. Uh, I know it doesn't look all benty and everything like that and 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 whatever. Uh, but it is sort of interesting. And the one thing that I thought of, even though I am super excited about it coming out, is that this is going to be a hard time fitting into my media center. And uh, so that's the headline here. Good luck fitting this thing into your uh, media center. Uh, and this is called uh, PS5 Engineered to Enrage. Uh, yeah, it should be, you know, I don't know. I, I, I took some liberties, so, you know, whatever you're going to say about it, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. This is uh, available at my uh, uh, online store at lenperlpstore.com, or if you're a Patreon backer at patreon.com forward slash len, you can, uh, you can get it right now. There you go. Excellent. Also, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us today. Rob, where can people keep up with all of your other work? You can definitely find me over at smrpodcast.com, and I am at Rob Dunwood on everything. So, um, you know, definitely reach out to me. Excellent. Go check that out, folks. Good times, good stuff, good information. Really, really, really good show. I mean, I made a big uh, deal out of the fact that Rob was even able to do the show, but it was also a really good content in the show as well. I should mention that too. Uh, go check that out. Also, uh, don't forget, folks, that uh, you can support our show in lots of different ways. The, the best way and the most direct way is on Patreon. Uh, that's a way to give us value for the value you get back from the show, and we try to give you some perks as well. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash Patreon. Patreon. And we have a store, and I know not all of you want masks, but if you do, we now have cloth masks in the DTNS store. Who wouldn't want to walk around with the DTNS logo on their face? Go check it out at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. If you have feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you'd like to join us live, well, hey, we are live. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Adobe's Veronica Belmont. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>